You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you level up with IT learning everywhere you go. I'm Zach Memmis, your host for this episode of CompTIA Linux Plus. And in this episode, managing services with System D. And we've asked our expert, Don Bizet, to tell us more. Don, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here, Zach. I'm ready to dive into the world of System D, which yeah. is a, a really powerful new technology. I'm going to say new. It's actually been around since, I think, 2008, but really gained prominence in the last five to six years. Uh, it is responsible for powering the majority of Linux distros that are out there. So really important that we need to learn how it works, what it does, and because everything it's doing is behind the scenes. So in this episode, what we're going to do is kind of pull back the curtain and get a chance to see exactly what System D is like, how it functions, and how we can interact with it to keep our system up and running and make sure our services are operating properly. Well, how are services controlled under Linux? So, you know, there's a few different ways this stuff can be controlled, and we're going to focus on System D, but it's not the only way. So that there's many systems that use the original Unix init system. So, mm. you know, when Linux boots up, there's a kernel, right? And the Linux kernel gets called. That's really important. That's the, that's the part that Linus Torvalds wrote. But the kernel itself doesn't interact with the user much. It's kind of limited in what it can do. So it's it's actually, I don't want to say it's not impressive, but it, from a from a standpoint of computer technology, it's very impressive. But from a standpoint of human interaction, it's not very impressive at all. So what the kernel does is as soon as it fires up, the next thing that it does is it launches what's called an init process, right? And the init process is what actually starts all the various services and makes your operating system work. It, it seems super impressive to us, but technologically, it's really basic. In fact, in the original versions of, of Unix, they used what was just called the sysv init. The sysv is system five, uh, was you know, contracting one of their releases. Uh, and the, the sysv init, what it would do is it just had a folder with a bunch of scripts in it. And it would run the scripts one after the other, and that would start your system up. And then when you got to a login prompt, it was because at some stage, a script was run that launched a shell or a console and then made that available to you. Mm. That's all it was, right? Well, that sounds really simple because it was really simple. And it had certain drawbacks, certain problems, certain things that made it not efficient. The, the number one problem was that SysV and it ran everything in a serial order, one after the other. So it would run script one, then script two, then script three. And if script three took a long time or if it hung, the system just waited right there, right? So it wasn't terribly fast. So that was one problem that it had. The other problem was that the scripts were just run when the system booted up, right? And after that, if something changed on the system, the scripts wouldn't detect it unless you recalled them. That wasn't a problem back in the 1970s and in the 1980s. But fast forward to 2019 where we are, we are constantly adding and removing hardware from our systems. You might have USB thumb drives or webcams or whatever that plug in and go. Imagine if you plugged in a, a USB key and the system didn't even know that happened, mm. right? And we had to run these scripts and tell it to look for that missing hardware. So that is, is a, a problem with SysV and it. System D was created as the next generation of that to try and, and replace SysV and it uh, and do it in a different way. So what System D does is it's not just a series of scripts. System D is an actual program. It's an actual uh, daemon. It actually stands for system daemon. And if you've never heard that term, it's D-A-E-M-O-N, daemon. And in the, the Unix and Linux world, any program that runs in the background as part of the operating system that it runs unattended from the user is called a, a daemon. It's mm. just you know doing its old job in the background. It actually comes from a physics book that described some weird physical motion. I, uh, it's a, a crazy or history. some other book. <laughs> yeah, but but basically, uh, you know, these demons are what the system is running in the background, and it used to be the init scripts that would call them. Now it's the the system D executable. So this program runs, and it doesn't just run when the system boots up; it stays running. So system D stays running the whole time your system is online, and it's able to do things like well, one, it can detect hardware changes because it's always running. Two, it can do things in parallel. It can say, all right, I'm going to run these five routines all at the same time. And if one hangs, it's no big deal because I'm still doing the other four. And so it's faster, right? System D is faster, more stable. There are some people out there that don't like System D. You'll hear some people complain about it from time to time because it, it moves away from tradition, right? Traditionally, you could control your entire Unix-like operating system by modifying some text files. With system D, it's not like that. It does have configuration files, but it's actually doing a lot of stuff in a binary. And, and some people, if you're like a Unix purist, that, that's not something you're happy about. 
But I'll tell you, as a Linux administrator myself, I love it. I think it's faster. It works really well, uh, and it's a great way to deal things. So System D is is pretty prominent, and it's typically how we're going to be manipulating services. So going back to Zach's original question, hey, how are these services controlled? Yeah. You power on your system, mm -hmm. right? Uh, your BIOS kicks in. It reaches out to the hard drive. It finds the boot files, loads up that Linux kernel. Then the Linux kernel launches a NIT. And in this case, it would be the system D that it fires up. And then system D goes to the routine of starting everything else that you need to interact with your system and bring it online if it's supposed to, right? If there's things that aren't supposed to come online, it leaves them off. They, system D is what's actually controlling that. So how do we know if we are actually using system D? All right. So, uh, you know, uh, good question. I, I will say that all of the major Linux distros these days use system D. So if you get Ubuntu, you get Red Hat Enterprise Linux, CentOS, Fedora, Mint, um, it just, I mean, the list on and on. All of the major distros use system D by default. So the odds are you are using system D, but it's not 100%. There are some distros out there that have chosen not to go with system D that are following the old model, the sysv init. Uh, or there was actually another uh, init system called Upstart. Upstart was really just a slight modification of sysv init. It wasn't a, a full on like change. Mm. Um, so you may find some systems that do that. Typically, it's if you're running older versions. Like if you're running CentOS 7, you're using system D. But if you're running CentOS 6, you're using Upstart. Uh, and if you're running CentOS 5, you're running sysv init, right? So, you know, it, it's kind of changed over time. Uh, if you're running Ubuntu, they've been running system D for the last three or four versions, I think. And then before that, they were on sysv init. Uh, but there are current distros like Slackware. Slackware was actually the very first Linux distro that I ran back in 1993, 1992, three, I think 1990. Either way, uh, it ran sysv init back then, and it runs sysv init today. Uh, they, they have not moved over to systemd because they, they follow that model of a pure Unix type deployment. Um, there's other ones, there's variants of Debian. I think there's one that's called uh, Devlon that actually uses uh, sysv init instead of systemd but none of the major distros. So if you're deploying something in a business, if you, you're deploying something where you need support, all of those companies are using systemd. But we can verify, right? Let, let's, let's be sure, right? So I've got a CentOS box here in front of me and I'm running CentOS 7 and I, I know that it defaults to systemd. Uh, I shouldn't say default, like it just runs systemd. But if we wanna verify that, there's a few different ways. I mentioned the boot order earlier. And when I turn the computer on, the kernel fires up and the first thing it does is it starts init, right? So technically your init process is the very first process that runs, it's number one. So if we use a utility like PS, right? This is the, the process show command. It shows me all the processes running in the background. If I do a PS AUX, right? That says show all of the processes with the user that's attached to them and uh, X, I can't remember what X does, uh, it's like a, services or something, I can't remember what X is, but if I do PSAUX and I run that, it will show me all the processes that are running. And if you look at these process numbers, right? It's this second column, I've got process 13,999, process 14,416. When a process run, it gets a number. And when it closes, the number goes away. And then it just kind of keeps incrementing and growing. So over 14,000 processes have run since I booted this machine up. Yeah, it's a couple. Which hasn't been up that long, right? I've been up for an hour and a half. <laughs> and so, so that's a, a big number. But if I scroll up on that list, let's just scroll, scroll, scroll. The numbers get smaller and smaller. These are processes that ran early on and are still running. And I can find process number one right there, PID number one. And if I look to the side over here, it's slash USR, slash lib, slash system D, slash system D. That mm. tells me that I'm running system D. Uh, I'm on CentOS. Let me jump over to Ubuntu. Uh, so this is an Ubuntu machine. And I can do the exact same thing here uh, if I jump into my terminal. And I'll just do PSAUX. And I'm just going to feed it into the head command, save a little time. And there's my process ID 1. And I can see, oh, this one's actually a little interesting. It's telling me slash sbin slash init. Hmm. All right, now wait a minute. I said this defaulted to system D. That's not system D. If you see no. slash sbin slash init, that's sysv init. Okay. However, if I relied on this, I might get tricked. And let me show you what I mean, because I'm I'm like 99.9% .9 positive this should be system D. I didn't check before the show, so that's my fault. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you pull up a, a, a listing, I'm going to do an ls l of slash sbin. I want to see the binaries that are in that file or in that folder. Okay. 
and I go in here and find a knit. Actually, let me just do slash sbin slash knit. There we go. They're tricking us, right? Oh. It's a symlink. They have symlinked slash sbin slash init does exist, and it's being pointed to slash lib slash systemd slash systemd. So there we go. So it, it looked like in the process output that we weren't. Now, that means that we can't really trust the process output, can we? The PSAUX, it works if we're full on running systemd, but it could trick us with older stuff. But if we actually look at slash sbin slash init, it's in the official standard that any operating system that's using the Linux kernel has to have a file in slash sbin slash init. Even if it's not what's called, it has to be there. And so that's a more reliable way to look and see what we're, we're running. If I jump back over to my CentOS box and do the same thing in slash sbin, I'm going to look for, so I'm running ls dash l to get a, a long output slash sbin slash init. And I can see they've linked it there as well. The difference is in the process command, that PSAUX. On CentOS, it's actually showing me the true binary. On Ubuntu, they're showing me the link instead of the binary. So they've, they've changed the way that command works. But I can see here they're both clearly running SBIN. Now, I mean, uh, systemd. Now, if I looked in here and it actually said slash SBIN slash init and it was green and that was that, then I'm running sysv init or upstart. Upstart, I mentioned, was like an upgrade to sysv init, not a replace, not a... Uh, uh, like a true change. So it would be slash sbin slash init as well. So I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between upstart and sysv init, but that doesn't matter for us. I know we're running systemd. So, so systemd starts right after the kernel, right? Yeah, and yeah. Then, then what happens? So it's a big deal, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the first thing. And if systemd crashes, your system crash, right? It's powering mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So once it fires up, then it's got to get to work. And it says, okay, now it's time for me to do my job. I need to start some services. I need to open up some ports on the system for network communication. I need to figure out whether we're going to load a GUI or go straight to the command line. It has to do all these different things. And it does that through the use of unit files, right? Unit files are stored in, if I change directories here, I'm going to go into slash lib, slash systemd, slash system, right? If you go into that folder right there and pull up a listing, what you're going to find is a ton of files. And each file will be a name, and then it'll end in dot .service or dot .timer, dot .target, dot .slice. Each one is kind of something different. Most of them are dot .service, right? Those dot .service files are identifying daemons. Daemons are going to run in the background. Those are services or applications that run and just keep running and, and do the thing, all right? Other ones, though, like dot .target, that's a user environment. Right, so there's a dot target file for if I want to have a GUI. Right, it's actually I think called graphical something or another. Uh, <laughs> it's in here. Uh, remembering the names of these is pretty hard because there's so many. Yeah, graphical dot target right there. Uh, and then there's a command line one which is actually called multi dash user dot target. Um, there's several others that are like that. You'll also find dot socket, which is identifying a network port that's going to be opened or possibly a name pipe or something that'll allow an application to talk to another application. Uh, via network service. Um, let's see, that was targets, services, and sockets. Those are the most common. Uh, you also see dot mount. So those are where it'll mount a hard drive partition. You still have the file system table, the slash etc slash fstab file, but you don't need it anymore if you don't want because systemd can use dot mount unit files to be able to specify what to reach out to. So when systemd starts, it's actually parsing all of the stuff in this directory and looking at it and saying, all right, what do I need to do? And if we pick, pick somebody here, somebody easy, SSD, SSH. All right, so SSH, that's the secure shell daemon. And it's running by default on most Linux systems so that we can create a secure remote shell, connect in and get a command prompt, right? So it should be starting when the system starts. If I look inside of that file, so let me just cat sshd.service, there we go. There's not a whole heck of a lot in here, right? So it starts with this uh, blocked quote right here where it says unit. And from there, it goes on to specify information about that daemon. So I can see that this is the open SSH server daemon and it has documentation, right? There's a man file that's available for it. So it's got that registered here. And then it's saying, we wanna start it, but don't start it right away. You need to make sure that the network.target environment has started, right? We have to have networking working before we can start SSH. And we need the SSHD keygen service running. 
So this is setting up a hierarchy, right? Uh, like an order and dependencies that uh, system D is able to use. So it says, okay, I can't start this one first. I need to start network.target and I need to start sshd-keygen.service. So once those are started, then I can come back and start this one. And remember, it's doing all this in parallel. So mm -hmm, it can reach mm -hmm. out and try and do multiple things at once. And then after that, it says once, right? After it says, I can't start until these are started. But once means once I start, I want this other thing to start as well. Now, SSHD-keygen service is listed twice. And what that's saying is it needs to be started when I start. But if something goes wrong, I need that one started again because I depend on it, right? That's establishing that dependency too. So we've got those entries. And then after that, we see the actual service, right? And so it's telling me I can find my configuration in slash etc slash sysconfig slash sshd. That's where the configuration is going to be. And then when we execute, when we start, here's the command that it runs. Slash user slash sbin slash sshd. That's an executable. Dash d tells it to run as a daemon, run in the background. Otherwise, when that shell closed, the, the application would close. We can see what to do when we close it. And it's going to run the kill command, and it's going to shut that one down. Uh, you can see how to kill it. Uh, you're just uses a process execute. It sounds really violent, but just <laughs> exiting. Uh, and then restart. If there's a failure, if it crashes, it's going to try and restart it. And if it does a restart, it'll wait 42 seconds, right? This is all defined right here. When we install this service, if I want it running every time, it's going to install it and attach it to multi-user.target. So when that starts, which is our, our command line, when the command line starts, it's going to make sure that SSH starts as well. These are unit files, and the unit files are just text. You can, you can actually go in and edit them if you want. It's not a great idea to edit these. Most of the time when you install it, when you install the SSHD service, it creates these files for you, right? So I, I didn't create these. They were made for me. If I want to modify them, I usually will not modify it here because if we get an update, right? So SSHD gets an update, and they update this unit file. It's going to overwrite my changes. I'm going to lose them. So if you're going to make changes, don't make them in this folder. So I'm let me get back in here. Uh, actually, let me zoom back out. There we go. So I'm in slash lib slash system D slash system. You really should never edit anything in slash lib. It should just be left alone. But if you go into slash etc slash system D slash system, all right, and that folder might not exist. You might have to make it uh, on CentOS. It's there by default. So slash etc slash system D slash system as opposed to slash lib slash system D slash system. When you look in here, you'll find service files and target files and once and so on. These are where we're overriding what's done inside of system D's folder. So if I want to make a change, I shouldn't go and change the files in slash lib. I can come right in here and create a file with the same name. And when I do that, this file will override the other one. And when an update comes along, it'll leave my file alone, right? Now, I haven't overridden anything. And so everything in here was done by the system. Looks like Dbus is doing some stuff. We even have sysinit, which is for backwards compatibility with sysvinit. Uh, so some of these entries are already in here. Most of these are just links. Uh, in fact, I think all of them are just links. Um, well, no, some of them just have weird permissions on them. Uh, but many of them are links to other locations. And you'll see them pointing to slash lib or somewhere to override an activity uh, from somewhere else. So that's how that kind of functions. And that's really the heart and soul of systemd. Systemd is a binary. It's an executable that runs. Uh, in fact, I think I browsed right past it. If I go into slash lib slash systemd, and we look in here somewhere, oh, right here. There we go. There's the systemd executable. It's actually not very flashy at all. Um, it's do a human readable size on this one. It's a blazing 1.6 megabytes. <laughs> and yet that 1.6 megabytes is powering my entire user environment right now. Mm. The kernel is handling my hardware interaction and then system D is making all of my software work. I mean, this is super important software and it's really, really small. And then it relies on all those configuration files to do its job. Well, do we have to create unit files for new services, Don? You can. So yeah. if I'm installing a new service, you can go in and create and define them yourself. I've, I've had to do that on occasion, but normally the services will create them automatically, right? Mm. So let's say, um, let me give you an example. I, I want to I be a web server, right? So I want to install Apache. Well, if I take a look inside of my systemd library folder, so I'm back in slash lib slash systemd slash system. If I look for any file that starts with HTTP, uh, oh, shoot, I actually see it right there, httpd.service. So it looks like I'm already a web server. Uh, that file is defining the Apache service and getting it set up to do its job, right? Well, 
I didn't create that file, or at least I don't remember doing it. So when I installed HTTPD, it must have created that, right? If I were to remove HTTPD, so if I do a uh, sudo yum uh, remove, or er uh, we'll just remove uh, HTTPD. There we go. So I'm going to uninstall it. So I'm uninstalling HTTPD. And now I'll just take a, a look again. And I see there's no unit file defined for it anymore. So when it uninstalled HTTPD, it knew to take away that unit file. And if I install it back again, so I'm just going to come in here and do an install. And when I do that, it's going to go through, it's going to do the install. There it goes. And if I take a look, I can see it created that file again, right? Hmm. So most services, if you're installing them from a package file, whoever the developer is that created that software will know, hey, this is the unit file I need, and it'll go ahead and create it for you. So you really don't have to worry about it. You don't have to go in and edit these things. It just does it. Now, I will tell you, sometimes you install software, and it doesn't create the unit file for you, right? And that might be software that's designed to be run on demand, okay? You need unit files for software that runs in the background, that runs automatic without interaction. I want this web server running all the time. It needs a unit file. But if I have something like OpenOffice, right? OpenOffice, I need it to run when I'm interacting with it. I don't want it running in the background. So there's not going to be a unit file for OpenOffice. Those are just user applications, all right? But sometimes when you install a service, it still doesn't create the unit file because most services don't start automatically. You've got to configure them. And we do that with system CTL. System CTL is a utility that is packaged alongside System D. It's the system control utility, and it lets us control System D and do things that otherwise might require us to edit some files. So for example, if I want HTTPD to start right now, I could do sudo systemctl start HTTPD, right? And it's going to read the unit file. It's actually looking for that unit file. And I should have typed this the whole way and said HTTPD.service because that's the unit file name and it's going to look for it, find it, and start it, okay? If you leave the extension off, it looks for services first because I'm, I'm telling it to start something and that way it doesn't look for .socket, .target, and those guys, right? But if you want, the, the full name would actually have .service on the end. So it's going to find it, it's going to start it, all right? Now we can start a service even if it doesn't have a unit file. If it's got dependencies, things will break. But even if it didn't have one, you could do that. But when the system reboots, that service is not going to be started by default unless we tell it. And we could go in and modify the, the actual service file and, or the, the unit file and actually tell it, yes, uh, multi-user multi or graphical depends on this file. We need HTTPD to start, right? Or you can just do it right here with systemctl. You can say systemctl enable HTTPD, right? And when I run that, look what it did. Created a symlink from slash etc slash systemd slash system slash multi-user dot target dot once slash HTTPD dot service. So it put a symlink in slash etc, right? And it's pointing to slash user slash lib slash systemd slash system slash HTTPD dot service. It didn't edit anything inside of slash lib or slash user slash lib it edited instead inside of slash etc. And even then it wasn't really an edit, it was just a link that says now, whenever I start the multi-user target, I will also start HTTPD. It did that for me. I didn't have to create unit files. I didn't have to go and modify slash etc. It was just done automatically. And if I say, you know what? I want the web server, but I don't want it to start automatically. I can just come in and say disable. And when you do that, it removes the link. It didn't disable Apache. I can still run Apache. If I do uh, sudo systemctl start HTTPD, like that, uh, and then I can do status. So uh, sudo systemctl status HTTPD, and it will actually show me that it's active and running right now. It's up and operational, okay? But looking up here, it says that it's loaded, but it also tells me that it's disabled, which means if I reboot, Apache's not going to be running anymore. Right. If I go back and enable it again, let me do that. And then we pull that status. What I'm going to see now is that the service is enabled. So if I reboot, Apache is going to come back up and we'll be in business. So the important part here is that we do all of this without ever actually editing the file. Systemctl does it all behind the scenes for us. So 
this is another area where we kind of deviate away from the way that Unix used to be, where we'd edit all these script files. Now it's all automated through system CTL. How does system D keep track of which services to run? So we've kind of seen that a little bit with our dependencies, mm -hmm. but it really boils down to the target files, right? The target files are what defines what's going to get fired up and, and so on. Uh, so let, let's take a look at one of those target files. Uh, if I get, what folder am I in? I'm in the right folder, slash lib, slash system T, slash system. If I pull up a listing of star.target, all right, you'll see a lot of targets, right? Targets are like collections of unit files. It says, hey, if I want the network to function, I've got a network target, and here's all the stuff I need for the network to function. And you'll see other things in here that are, that are like that. You know, if I want um, remote crypt uh, encryption to work or reboot to work or swap files to work, they've all got different targets. And those targets are defining all the services needed to make that work. So if I want to boot to a command line, just to a command line, then I need what's in multi-user.target. If I take a look at that file, let's use less on multi-user.target, I can look in there and it's actually not a very big file at all, right? But that's because it's including some things that it needs. It says, all right, multi-user can start whenever it wants, right? So I don't see a, oh, actually I do have a require, don't I? Here's a require that says basic.target. So before multi-user can start, anything in basic.target has to start. Then this one can start. And once it starts afterwards, We'll fire up basic.target if it isn't already, but we've got rescue.service, rescue.target. We've got a few other things uh, that can be triggered as well to you know, get our system up and, and running. Well, let's look at basic.target. So if I just, I'll cat basic.target, and I look in here, it's also not very big at all, right? But it's got that it requires sysinit.target, and it's calling several other things too. And if I look at sysinit, Dot target. We're kind of following this back, right? Going back, back, back. And we see how it's calling more and more things. All of this is coming together to build the environment that that is required for our system to boot. If I want a graphical user interface, then I would need graphical.target. And you'll see where it depends on multi-user. The command line has to work before I can launch stuff to get the GUI, right? They all are inter interdependent. As a human, it would take me forever to sift through all these files and build out the tree of dependencies, but System D does it every time you boot. It parses through these files, figures out the dependencies. It uh, it actually doesn't monitor the files on an ongoing basis. If I change a file right now, it won't recognize it unless I tell it to reload, right? So you can go in and, and well, you can reboot your system. It's one way to do it. Uh, or like with a service, you use the restart command and then it'll reload the unit file for that service. But otherwise, it's figuring out all those dependencies, kind of mapping it together. It gets pretty complex because of the sheer amount of files, but at the end of the day, they are just simple text files. You can view it all. Well, can we change between the targets? Oh, you can, yeah. You know, uh, my system right now, if I were to reboot, mm -hmm. it's set to default to the graphical user interface. So it, it's basically set to boot to graphical.target, right? But if this is a server, I don't need a GUI. I, I might want to have the GUI installed so that when I'm sitting at the server, I can use it, but the rest of the time, I don't need a GUI run. So I could actually switch targets and tell it, hey, don't, don't run graphical anymore, just run multi-user. Mm -hmm. And we can do that pretty easy. Um, so here I am in my, uh, my, my command prompt, and I could be in any prompt, it really wouldn't, or any folder, it wouldn't matter which one. Uh, I'm gonna do a sudo systemctl, isolate, and so I'm telling you, I want to, to target a specific uh, target, that's a little redundant, uh, and then I'll just say multi-user.target, all right? Multi-user means, yes, it's command line, but it's not just one console just for you. It still allows network services and other things to run. And so when I run that, see how my system freaked out? Yeah. Right? It recognized immediately, okay, we're not going to do the GUI target anymore. We're going to just do a command line. And so now I can come in and I can log in, assuming I can remember my password. And there we go. I'm not in a GUI. I'm just in the command line. And so now if I reboot, I'm going to boot just to this interface right here you know this is my well, actually i need to go and modify my grub uh loader to tell it exactly what i want um but at this point i'm now in just command line uh, x windows and all the gui stuff is not running at all i can switch back with that same command uh well a little bit different so if i do sudo systemctl isolate and then i'll do graphical.target and that's going to switch me back. And now it's loading X Windows. See how it's taking a moment? It's not like X Windows was running in the background. It's got to relaunch all that stuff and get me in here and uh, and get me put back in place. Now, because this is happening after my boot operation and all that, 
you see how it's kind of like screwed up my resolution yeah. and, and all that. Uh, that's one of the trickier parts about moving from one to another. If something's not defined in the unit files or some other configuration file, then stuff gets lost. Oh, I cleaned up. Well, sort of. I got large icons now. So, <laughs> so um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people like me. If you do this stuff a lot, you'll end up writing scripts to kind of automate some of the changes. And so, for example, I have a little script in my home directory. This will show you how often I do this to manually set my resolution so that I can just run it real quick. And then I'm right back in now my icons are the right size and all. So you can switch between targets at the drop of a hat, but just know that there are certain penalties to it. There's certain things that happen on your system you might not expect. So definitely test it out, you know, run through the routine a few times. But that's basically the nuts and bolts of system D right there. There's a, a lot more to it, but the basic operation is there's a ton of text files. It reads them and performs as they dictate. Great episode. Managing services with System D. Wonderfully done, Don. And before we move on, what else would you like to say? Uh, you know, if you want to learn more about System D, definitely check out uh, there's a System D website. Uh, it'll be like your first Google response, I'm sure. Uh, but there's also a whole suite of other utilities. I use System CTL. There's Journal D for the special logging system that System D uses. Uh, there's Hostname CTL for changing your computer hostname. There's a number of other CTL commands that are all a part of what System D creates. So there's a lot more than what we went over in this episode. I was just focusing on really what's involved in getting your system up and operational and getting your services running. Great advice as usual. Here's some more great advice. Watch every episode of CompTIA Linux Plus. You're going to be glad you did. It's going to help you now and in the future. And keep studying. Take advantage of the supplementary information in our course library. It's there to do one thing, help you be even more successful. So check that out as well. And tell everybody you know about IT Pro TV. You know, IT Pro TV is binge worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memes. And I'm Don Pazette. And we will see you again soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazetta. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, and thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you level up with IT learning everywhere you go. I'm your host, Zach Memes, for this episode of CompTIA Linux Plus. Managing Services with SysD in it is the name of this here episode. And Don Pizzette is going to be showing us the way. Don, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Well, glad to be back, Zach. And like I said, we're going to be tackling SysD in it. You know, in the last episode, we got a chance to see System D, which is the most popular initialization system in Linux right now. However, if you're working out there in the field, there are still many, many systems deployed that use the older SysV in it. In fact, on servers, it's actually pretty common. So definitely something we want to learn about, and that's what we're going to do right here in this episode. We're going to learn a little bit about how SysV in it, how SysV in it works. It's a tricky uh -huh. one to say. You, can't, yeah. <laughs> so, it can happen to everybody. <laughs> to anyone. Uh, we'll see how it works. We'll see how to manage it, manipulate it, and just kind of see how to operate in an environment that is running SysV in it. Fantastic. Don, how are services controlled under Linux? All right, so um, basically, all of our services inside of Linux depend on an initialization of some sort, right? And system D, we, we've already seen, is one way, right? Your system boots up, and system D is, is well, kind of follow a boot process, right? You know, your kernel kicks in, and then it launches your init. And so system D would launch, and then it would control services from there. But with sysv init, it's a little bit different. Your system boots up, your kernel fires up, and then the kernel calls a series of scripts. SysV init is not a binary executable. Well, I guess it sort of is. It's a little bit of a binary. But the majority of what it does is all being driven by script files. We saw with systemd, it was driven by unit files, which aren't really scripts. They're kind of like descriptions. And then systemd knows what to do with it and executes. SysV init just runs scripts. Whatever happens to be in the script, it runs. And you can put literally anything in there, like starting a service and passing parameters to a service and checking to make sure the service is running or the permissions are set right. All of that is different things that sysv init can do, and it does it in a significantly different way than system D does. Now, many people feel that system D is the better of the two options for modern systems, but if you've got a server that millions of users rely upon and it needs to be rock solid, sysv init's been around since the late 1970s, early 1980s. It's a very stable, tried and true system. And that's why when you go out and, and look at servers, you'll find many still do it. Let, let me give you an example. If you're deploying Linux servers in Amazon Web Services, AWS, they have what's called Amazon Linux. And Amazon Linux is based off of Sentinel.
CentOS 6, which is based on Upstar, which is based on Vinit. So <laughs> uh, it's kind of a long chain. So when you go into an Amazon Linux AMI, it's going to be using sysvnit initialization strings and all of that. So you've got to know it. Uh, Amazon Linux 2, which only recently reached production, that one now uses systemd. So they're moving in that direction. But most people haven't ported their workload over to it yet. So it is very, very common to encounter sysvnit systems. So how do we know if we are using sysvnit? Yeah, so you know, if you've just been hired on somewhere, you're taking over a server, you might not necessarily know whether it's running sysvnit or not. Maybe you've got all your distros and version numbers memorized and you just know off that. But if not, we can double check. You know, I mentioned that the kernel is going to fire off the initialization system, and that might be systemd, or it might be sysvnit. Well, that process of firing off initialization is the very first thing that it does. So we can just look at process ID number one, and that will usually tell us whether we're running systemd or sysvnit, right? So for example here, let me take this. Uh, I've got two boxes here. This one is a CentOS 6 box. So um, it's running CentOS 6.7. Uh, which is currently supported. So this isn't like this is old and crusty, like you can run this in a production environment. And if I come in and do a PSAUX, right? Uh, and I'm going to just pipe that into the uh, head command. So I want to see the first 10 lines of my process list. When I look at the top processes here, process number one right here, fired off by root. If I come along to the side here, I can see that that's slash sbin slash init. If it just says that, slash sbin slash init, then odds are you're running sysv init. Now, it's not a guarantee, and that's because some of the OS distributions, like Ubuntu, Ubuntu will actually show slash sbin slash init also. But when you go and look at that binary, if you do an ls l slash sbin slash init, when you look at the binary on an Ubuntu system, on a newer Ubuntu system, it will actually be a symlink pointing to systemd. Right. So be careful with this one. In fact, if I go to like my here's a CentOS 7 box, uh, let me get into a terminal here and I'll do the same kind of thing with PS aux and I'll pipe that into head. And that very first process I can see right here is pointing to slash user slash lib slash systemd slash systemd. So this is pretty obvious, right? Ubuntu, uh, at least in the newest ones in the 18 releases, uh, they're a little bit trickier. So always be on the lookout for that. But that's probably the easiest way to tell whether you're running sysv init or not. So what you're looking for is that slash sbin slash init. That tells you what you're running. Um, and once you've got that figured out, now you know that you need to administer the system a slightly different way than you would a systemd system. So sysv init starts right after the kernel, right? So then what happens? All right. So sysv init does have a binary, right? Mm -hmm. So it's slash sbin slash init, right? So our, our BIOS fires up on the system and it does all the hardware detection. Then it reaches out, it finds a hard drive partition, it finds the slash boot partition, finds the kernel, launches the kernel. The kernel then turns around and says, okay, I'm, I'm a sysv init system, and it launches slash sbin slash init. And when it does, it then proceeds to start launching a series of scripts. That, that init executable is then just going to run a series of scripts, and it runs them in serial, not in parallel. System D does stuff in, in parallel. It'll do more than one thing at the same time. But with sysvnit, it runs one script at a time. And when it finishes, then it runs the next one. When that's done, then it runs the next one, and so on. And it all kicks off with one script. Let me show you here on this system. If you go into slash etc, you'll find a folder in there called rc.d, this folder right here. Now, this folder has changed a lot over the years. Uh, originally, there were there were different folders. In fact, see all these light blue folders up here? Yeah. RC, RC0.D, RC.local, RC.sysnet. All these are like previous iterations of what, uh, uh, of what sysv in it, or, or like system 4 in it, or system 3 in it. Like each of them kind of relied on different folders. So they're there for backwards compatibility. But now, pretty much everything is tucked away inside of RC.D. And if we go into that folder and look, you'll see a number of subfolders based on all sorts of different stuff. And each one of these kind of influences what sysv init does when it launches. And the main one that we want to pay attention to is this guy right here, rc.sysinit. When sysv init starts, this is the first thing that it calls. It reaches out to this script and it executes it. And then from there, it will proceed to 
spawn other things. And there's a lot of things that influence what it's going to spawn, uh, which are all kind of tied to uh, parts of, of what it does. But this one's really the heart and soul of it. So sys, uh, slash spin slash init runs, and it calls this script to then initialize the system. Does that one script then call other scripts? Absolutely, yep. So uh, it, it runs, and as it's finishing, it's then launching other things based on a certain criteria, right? And that criteria is what's called a run level. So notice all these other folders over here, rc0.d, 1.d, 2.d. Those are, are tied to run levels, right? So in, in Linux, you have seven run levels, and each one indicates a different status of the machine. So for example, zero actually means the system is shut down. Now, you might wonder to yourself there, like, why would I have a run level for shutdown? Well, you got to tell the system to shut down. And you might actually have scripts that are a part of that. When your system is shutting down, it needs to, uh, you know, basically perform a few tasks, maybe, you know, stop writes to the hard disk or so on and close out what it's doing. And those would be part of the shutdown scripts. You also have uh, RC6 here, which is reboot. And so that's when your system is rebooting, it might have certain tasks. They might be the same. They might be totally empty. There might be no tasks tied to reboot and shutdown, but that's what those run levels are. The other run levels are kind of up to the distro that they can operate in different modes. And they've They've kind of standardized on it. So most of the distros follow the same pattern, but it's not a guarantee. So always be careful. If you're not sure, check your distros documentation. A lot of them uh, will document what their run levels are in their initialization table. So there's a file. If I, I'm just going to cat slash etc slash init tab. That's the initialization table. And when you look in that file, most distros do take the time to document the run levels. And so I can see right here for CentOS and this applies to uh, CentOS and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I can see the seven run levels. So see how zero is halt? Halt is when the computer's turned off. Uh, and then six is reboot. One is single user mode. That means that only one user can be logged into the system and nobody else can be logged in. Right? That's actually pretty handy if you're an administrator. Sometimes you want to modify a file, but it's always in use. Somebody's accessing it or there's a file share. People are accessing it over the network. You need to make sure you have exclusive access to it. So you can boot in single user mode and you know you'll have that. There's multi-user without, it says without NFS. It's actually multi-user without networking. So it boots up in the full mode, but with no networking services at all. And that way you can ensure nobody over the network is getting into the system. If you think you've been hacked, here's a great way to boot and shut off your network. And now you can get in and examine the system and you know you're not communicating out. Uh, you have full multi-user mode, which is run level three. And that's where you're saying, look, I want to boot up to a command line interface, but I'm allowing multiple users. People can SSH in or I have more than one console. So a lot of people can be working in the system. That's the run level that most servers run at. Uh, run level four, it's actually not used. I, I, I don't think I've seen a distro yet that makes use of it, but it's, it's available. So if you want to create a custom run level, that's usually what run level four is reserved for. Run level five, it's labeled here as X11, but that means that we want to boot a GUI. We want to boot a graphical user interface, which is typically the X environment, but it, you, know, you might have some alternate user interface. And that one is multi-user with networking and a GUI. So it's kind of like the, the, the full shebang, right? It boots everything, uh, and then you get access to the system. So those are the run levels. And looking at this slash etc slash rcd.d folders, kind of hard to say, mm. uh, all these subfolders, rc1.d, rc2.d, these contain scripts. So when I boot into multi-user mode, command line only, rc.sysinit is going to run, and then it's going to look in rc3.d, and it's going to look at what scripts are in there. And look at all these scripts that I've got. I've got where it's starting uh, the quota daemon and IP tables for the firewall, the LVM monitor for my logical volume manager, uh, network manager is starting, postfix, all these different things will start when my system starts. These are tied to various services, right? Postfix, uh, that's a, an email service. SSJ, SSHD, that's my secure shell daemon. These are all being started. That's how it knows what services to fire up. And it's all controlled by the run level. If I look in, uh, let's go into rc5.d. Uh, all right, so this is if I boot with a full GUI and I'll see things are a little bit different. There's a lot of overlap, right? So I still see SSHD right there. I still see postfix, right? But I'll also see some things in here that are tied to uh, X windows. Let's see, I should be seeing GDM in here somewhere. I must be skimming over it. It's hard when you're under pressure on the show, but somewhere in here is GDM, which starts <laughs> the, the graphical device. Uh, 
device manager to have to let you get logged in and all of that. So it's additional things that'll get loaded. You may see variations depending on which run level you boot. That's what all happens right here. Then there's one more thing that may not get loaded, but typically doesn't. Uh, back in rc.d, there's one more file, rc.local, okay? On really old systems, I'm talking Unix, right? Uh, it would run rc.sysinit, then it would run all the scripts for the run level, and then last, it would run rc.local, and that was your way to override anything else that was run before you kind of undo or redo stuff. Um, most distros have the file for backwards compatibility, but don't do anything with it. So it's usually empty, or it may not even be called at all. You'd have to check your run level scripts to see if they return to it, or check rc.sysinit. So like, if I take a look at my rc.local, let's see what's in it. Um, yeah, it's pretty much empty. In fact, it just uh, touches a file to indicate that it's locked and that's it. So it's not used in this case, but it is there. So if you want to make use of it, you can. Versus if I take a look at rc.sysinit and take a look at that one, there's all sorts of stuff in here as it goes through mounting your disks or turning on SE Linux right there, uh, you know, doing all sorts of other stuff. This is a, a big deal, right? It's got a lot of work to do. rc.local is empty. Do we have to modify the script files for each uh, run level when we install a service? All right, so uh, good question, right? So I showed where SSHD was in there, right? Mm -hmm. So my SSH daemon is starting automatically, and it's in more than one run level, right? Mm -hmm. So if I install a service, like let's say I want to install a web server, right? So I'm going to install Apache. And when I install Apache, I want it to run when my system boots, okay? Well, if you notice with SSH, it was set to start at run level three, and it was set to start at run level five, uh, they skipped run level four because it's not used, and they skipped run level two because run level two boots with no networking. So why why bother starting a, a web server if there's no networking, right? Um, or SSH in that case. I might want a web server to do the same thing. So I want the web server to start with run level three and run level five. So to do that, I mean, we could manually create scripts and put them in there. But what you'll find is that most of this is handled for us through a handful of commands, all right? So let me, let me just show you kind of how this works. So on my system, I'm going to do a sudo yum install httpd, right? So I'm going to install Apache, right? Uh, and apparently it's already installed. Great. So, <laughs> so I've already got it installed. Now, once it's installed, you can go through and create scripts. So if I go back to, uh, let's see, rc3.d and take a look in here, I don't recall seeing HTTP in the list. Oh, it is right there. K15 HTTPD. So I've already got it installed and it's already set to start. So I picked a bad example. All right, let's do, uh, maybe we'll do a database instead. Is MySQL on here? Let me just skim the list to make sure I don't make the same mistake twice. All right, we'll do MySQL. So I'm going to do sudo yum install MySQL and I'll do MySQL dash server as well and we'll do a dash y so it just does it. All right, so it's going to install the database server. Now, when the database server is installed, it's not set to run automatically, or at least it shouldn't be. So I'm gonna pull a list back up here and look, and I do see it actually created a link right there. Mm. So it's smart enough to create the links with what the default run level should be. If we want it on three and we want it on five, it shows up right there. Now, what if that's not what we want though? I don't want my SQL to run, maybe I, I only want it to run when my GUI is running, but I don't want it to run when I'm booting to command line only or you know something crazy like that, right? Well, you can actually manipulate these pretty easy without having to write or even edit the scripts at all, right? So you certainly can come in here. Most of these are just sim links. See how they're light blue? If you uh, pull up a long listing, you'll see they're almost all sim linked to the init.d folder. And in there is where these text files are kind of being created. But we can manipulate all of this a few different ways. Um, the easiest way is to use the check config command, C-H-K-C-O-N-F-I-G, check config. What check config does is it lets you turn services on or off for different run levels. It defaults to run level three and five. So if I do a check config uh, and then I say HTTPD on, that's going to turn, oops, I need to sudo that. Let me sudo that command there. There we go. That's going to turn on HTTPD for run levels three and five. If I boot at run level one or two or four, it's not going to start, but three and five, it will. And that's kind of its default operation. If I say off, then HTTPD is not going to start in run level anything, right? It's going to turn them all off, right? 
But I can go a step further with this command and I can be really specific. I can say, for example, check config httpd dash dash level and then specify the levels I want. The default would be three, five, like that. So run levels three and five, that's where it's gonna start. Maybe I want it to run, well, I'll just leave it at three and five. Let's take um, MySQL, oops, sorry. I uh, have to do one more option here and say on, there. So I left off the little on tag, so it got unhappy with me. Let's say that I want MySQL to run in run level three and run level five and run level two, right? MySQL actually doesn't need the network in a traditional sense. You can use name pipes to access it. So maybe I want that database up and running even when the network uh, stack isn't up and going. So for that one, I could do a sudo check config dash dash level 235 MySQL D on. And now it's set to go with multiple run levels. So it's kind of a cool one. It's easy to lose track of this stuff though. And we could go and sift through the scripts and figure out where it's set to run and where it's set not to. So if I go into uh slash etc slash rc dot d slash rc two dot d and take a look in there i can find wait a minute http is in the list right it's actually sim linking to all of these but the script is telling it only to run at a certain run level and that run level is left off so if we try and track it right here through these sim links it really doesn't help we don't actually know if it's going to start or not so a better way to figure out what's going to start and what isn't is to use check config dash dash list and that's going to list your services and tell you what run levels they're going to execute at so if i run that i get this nice big list right here and it's got all seven run levels with a simple on or off next to each one so i can find http right uh whoops if i can scroll back up to it uh, i can find it right here and the mouse is my biggest challenge with this stuff. <laughs> uh, and I can see run levels one, uh, zero, one, and two, it's off. Run level three is on, four is off, five is on, six is off. So just three and five are on. Even though I saw an HTTPD link in slash etc slash rc.d slash rc2.d. And if I look at MySQL right here, I can see that it's a little different in that it's two, three, and five that are all turned on. Okay. This is a better way to see what's being run at each run level. If you just look at the links, you can't tell. You'd have to follow the link, and then you'd have to edit the script that it, or at least view the script that it links to. And in that script, it'll have an if statement at the beginning that says like, if run level equals, and it'll list the run levels where it's gonna start. That's a pain. Check config dash dash list. You'll see it all right there. And if you have a huge list, you can always pipe that into the grep command. And once it's in the grep command, uh, you can just say like, I'm looking for MySQL. And then you just get that one line that makes life a little bit easier there. So pretty easy to verify. Uh, we could also just do it manually. Like maybe, maybe I'm not so concerned about when the system starts. I just need to use MySQL for a little while right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for that, you'll use the service command. And we can just come in and say sudo service and then start. And whatever the services we want to start. If I want to start HTTPD, there we go. Uh, oops, I got it backwards. Uh, service HTTPD start. There we go. Uh, sorry, you have to say the service name first and start second. Mm -hmm. I got it backwards. So sudo service start httpd, and now it starts up. And I can do the same thing with like mysqld, which it'll probably be unhappy that I haven't secured it yet, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, we can start that one up. Yeah, it's warning me that I need to run the security startup script, but, uh, but there it goes. So now those two services are running. But let's say I'm at run level five right now, and those are up and running, and I reboot my system. If those aren't set to start with run level five, they won't be started when I reboot. So using the service command like this is not permanent. It's really just kind of a temporary thing just to get uh, get the service up and running and, and so on. And you can do a service status for any service uh, and take a look at like HTTPD and, uh, whoops, backwards again, darn it. Uh, service HTTPD status, there we go. Uh, and if we still do that one, I'll get it right eventually. We can see if the service is act actively running right now. You may find where it started with the script and then something went wrong and it closed. And so even though rc.d is telling it, yeah, you need to start this at boot, it may not be booted. So this is a good way to quick check that uh, and see. And I'll do the same thing with mysqld. And I can verify right there. They're both up and running uh, and happy. Now, how does this vnet know which run level to boot to? 
Uh, you know, I, I glanced over it earlier. So uh, we kind of have some defaults, right? Where we're saying boot to the graphical user interface or boot to the command line. Uh, and your, your OS or your distribution will typically default to one or the other. That comes from the slash etc slash init tab folder that I, or file that I opened earlier. Uh, if I cat that one, slash etc slash init tab. All right. So this is the file I brought up on screen earlier to show the run levels. Well, there's one tiny little line at the very end that I didn't mention. That's this guy right here that says ID colon five colon init default colon. All right. So this is telling the system what run level to boot to by default. So mine is set to default to run level five, which is a full graphical user interface. If I'm setting up a server, I probably don't want the GUI. So I'll tell it to boot to the command line, to boot to multi-user mode, which is run level three. So to do that, I would just edit this file and change that five to a three. And then when you reboot, it's gonna boot to the command line. And when you're ready, you can always change it back to a five again, and it'll boot up and, uh, and that'll be kind of the, the, the run level that it goes to. Now, that's if I wanna make a permanent change. Let's say it's just a temporary thing, right? Maybe I'm having some kind of crazy issues with X windows, and uh, I just wanna to, to dump out and get rid of all of X windows and then come back into X windows, but not kind of, not have to restart all my services or whatever. So we can actually change the run level whenever we want while the system is running. Now, it can have disastrous effects, so we need to be a little bit careful with it. You know, all of these scripts are gonna execute and do stuff. Uh, but if you ever want to change your run level just temporarily, there's a command you can run, which is init. Uh, if you run init followed by a number, let me pull up the man file for that. Uh, so if you just run init followed by a number, it will immediately change your system into whatever that other init level happens to be. Now, if you're going to do this, be really careful. If other users in the system, you can, you can really mess with them, especially if you're about to drop a single user mode. So you might want to use the who command to see who's logged in and how they're accessing the system to say, all right, here's people I need to contact before I change this run level. But assuming you're the only one in here, let me take this system and I'm gonna to go to multi-user mode, right? So I'm gonna say sudo init three. I wanna to drop to run level three. And when I run that, my system drops to the eensy weensy tiny little console. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get to see that. And we get uh, out the magnifying glass. Yeah, yeah, we'd have to use it here. Uh, <laughs> so we lose all the, you know, the cool, um, uh, screen enhancements and so on. Because right, right, now right. we're we're just in straight command line mode, and there we are, right? Uh, so now I'm kind of operating in this this different world. X Windows has been completely unloaded, and it's executed the scripts found in that RC3.d folder to move me into this kind of mode. And I can switch back if I want by saying init. Well, I got to sudo that sudo init, uh, and then move back into run level five. And when I run that. There we go. I see that it takes me back to my CentOS login screen and I can get logged back in. And now I'm back into the GUI. So we quickly and easily change our, our run level like that. Now, uh, most of the time, we're going to do it just like I did right there. It's going to happen fast. There may be times where you want to schedule changing the run level. And the, the official recommended way to do that is to use cron. You can set up a cron job to change the run level at a certain time if you want. Uh, that, that's one technique you can use. There used to be a command called telinit. And what telinit would do is it would let you set a time delay for when the run level would change. And many systems don't have the command anymore. And let's see if I do. Oop, I have to spell it right if you want to find it. Uh, I do have it. Okay, so there it is. Uh, telinit, it lets you change the system run level. So just like the init command, but the difference is it takes some options. The init command really didn't take any options. This one does. And one of the options is dash T, which is in here somewhere. Well. I didn't see it, but it, it does exist, uh, where you can come in and you can say, tell in it, and then what number you want to go to. So I'll say, I'm going to run to jump to run level three. And then you can say dash T followed by a time. And you know, maybe I want to wait 30 seconds before I do it. And so I can specify that. Uh, I would need to suit that command. Uh, and then I'll do that dash T 30 and run it. Okay, so that's going to start that timer. Well, notice how mine just totally ignored the timer. Mm -hmm. That's because the tell in it command it's an old command. It's not supported by most. Now, a lot of districts don't even have it, and the ones that do don't fully support it. So it's kind of the old way. So instead, if you want to schedule it, you're a little better off by uh, jumping in and doing uh, a cron job to run in it at a certain time. Fantastic information. Managing services with SysV in it. Great episode as usual. Thank you, Don. And before we move on, I think you have something else you'd like to say. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned before that SysV in it is really old and that system D is really new and shiny. And I, I personally like system D, but 
I think the sysvignette is still really, really important. You are going to find many, many servers that are out there that are rely upon it. And if you start jumping into other operating systems like FreeBSD and OpenBSD and those guys, they still use sysvignette too. System D hasn't made the leap over to those sides yet. So learning how this works is a skill that you'll be able to apply in many different places. Definitely, definitely a valuable one to have. Great advice. Thank you, Don. And here's some more great advice. So to come